coming up next, we have Ellen Clayton, uh, who will moderate our uh, legal panel. And I'll let her introduce her uh, panelists who are all uh, not only outstanding legal scholars, but um, just have been so kind with their time and with their thoughtfulness in preparing for this panel and uh, addressing the multiple and complex uh, issues here. So um, I'll let Ellen take it away and I will step back into the background and enjoy. Thank you. Um, well, first I would like to say that this has been, this is already an amazing conference. And, um, and we actually have to say the first two, uh, sessions have really set up the uh, set up set us up amazingly, um, and we have an incredible um, panel here. Uh, so let me introduce them quickly, and then uh, we will go from there. First of all, Michelle Mello is an empirical health law scholar of law and medicine at Stanford, and she focuses on law and regulation of health and population health. Erin uh, Fuse Brown is. Um, is at Georgia State University as expert on HIPAA, um, which we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about, I suspect, um, among many other things in healthcare privacy. And then Nathan Cortez is at uh, Southern Methodist University um, and is, uh, has really looked a lot at uh, the legal aspects of surgical black box recording. So this is just, a lot of expertise to address exactly the issues that we're talking about. Um, what I think I'd like to do is ask each of you to sort of identify um, a particular issue that you're really interested in. And then I'm going to uh, turn to addressing some of the issues of consent, privacy, um, and who has access to what and why um, for the rest of our discussion. But I would like you all um, to uh, uh, frame the issue for us. So who would like to begin? I'd be happy to kick us off. Great. I'm especially interested in thinking about the implications of this for medical liability and the nature and quantity of malpractice litigation we might expect to see, and also for how it may affect providers' obligations around disclosure of adverse events or things that may reasonably be perceived by patients as an adverse event. Uh, I suspect we're going to have, a, we'll, we'll hear more from you about that because it's obviously an elephant in the middle of the room. Um, uh, Nathan? Hi, everyone. Uh, I think my interests overlap. Uh, with Michelle's to a, a fair degree. I, I think what my interest in, in this system has always been, how can you take advantages of, of all the things, all the ways that this will help improve quality of care um, and not deter its use while still giving patients access to materials they might reasonably be expected to access. So, I think it's a fascinating problem. It's one that's going to become more pronounced over the next decade than less pronounced, and I'm happy to be working on it. Great. Um, and Erin? Hi, it's great to be here um, and with this, this terrific panel. And as, as Ellen, you've mentioned, it's one of the, the angles that I've been thinking about this, and I think it came up a lot in the last panel, was, is just the privacy concerns. I mean, of course, the, the foremost concern is the patient's privacy and the concerns a patient might have, um, how that, inf you know, that goes into the informed consent because their perceptions of how their privacy may or may not be protected or whether they have access to the recording after um, what may affect their desire to consent to such a, you know, to, to a recording of their operation. Um, but also their, their broader privacy concerns, right? There's sort of the beyond the patient's own privacy expectations. There's often this sense of do other people in the room have an expectation of privacy that may not be, may or may not be uh, triggered under HIPAA, but it may just be sort of a general professional sense of like, you know, do the do the employees and the staff and the surgeon and do the other people who are present have an expectation of privacy as well and what can be done for that? So Aaron, I would ask you to um, hold that for the moment um, because I want to turn to the elephant in the room. Um, and, I, and I want to come back to the issue that you're talking about because I think it's really important. Um, 
and I just, I don't want to lose it. But the, so let me frame up what I think the elephant in the room is and um, see what you all have to say about it. Um, it seems to me that recording is a fantastic idea. It's an amazing teaching tool. Um, it's an amazing way to improve quality. Um, I think there are some issues with quality and the role of machine learning and bias and other things like that that I'll just set as a sidelight. Um, but it's also clear that these data are going to go places. Um, that they're going to go. Uh, that they're going to be in the EMR. That uh, that they're going to be they're going to be shared. What are the companies that create these videos going to do with these data? I spend my time in genomics and 23 and Me and Ancestry and all these big uh, genetic testing companies love doing these tests because they love having the data themselves in addition to doing whatever they're doing and returning to uh, patients. Um, and if, they're, if it's going to go to data, how can we possibly deal with the fact that some patients are gonna look at this and they're gonna say, gee, my doctor screwed up or there was a bad outcome. And here's the thing that I can present in the courtroom that shows that. And so how do we, um, so how do we deal with the threat of liability, which is not trivial, and, and how do we think about how we control all this flow, how this flow, these, the flow of these data? And I would love for all three of you to talk about that, because I think that's really a very big deal that we haven't heard. Well, we haven't heard much about it. It's amazing we haven't heard about it yet, but now I'd love to hear what you all have to say about it. And Michelle, I'm gonna call on you because you teed it up. So I, I think you've hit the nail right on the head when you talk about patients sort of thinking, oh my gosh, something has gone wrong. And you know, let's begin by acknowledging that's already an issue because patients already have access to their medical records. In some institutions, there are open notes that have raised these same kinds of concerns that there would be misconstructions of that evidence. So what we're talking about really is just an intensification of a pre-existing concern. And I think that the way to address it is the same as for concerns that arise out of medical records, which is ensuring that the care team is available and proactively seeking to communicate with families who are absorbing this information and trying to make sense of it. Presumably that's most likely to be the case in the wake of an adverse event, but I can also imagine an overly enthusiastic husband who wants to watch his wife's C-section video uh, or some other family member who uh, is reviewing this footage and uh, becomes concerned by tense moments in the OR that are, you know, part of surgery and that resolve happily, but nevertheless raise concerns about error. I think that's a situation where uh, communication from the care team is going to be essential. So I, I would not advise circulating videos to patients or making them available to patients without having somebody follow up to ask the patient, what did you think? What, where did you have any concerns? We thought things went well. Um, but if there's any concerns you have, we'd like to address them because helping patients to understand that tense moments in the OR happen and um, are overwhelmingly resolved without lingering injury is really important in avoiding the kind of misconceptions that can give rise to lawsuits. I think it's equally possible though, that watching these recordings could help patients understand that in fact, there weren't any tense moments in the OR, that the patient unfortunately had a bad outcome after surgery, a known complication, for example, but um, you know, what happened during surgery was pretty routine and ha having somebody walk the patient through that with the video could be very helpful in averting misconceptions that otherwise arise from the absence of information, because we know that one of the things, leading things that prompts patients to file malpractice claims is a thirst for information that has not been given to them voluntarily by the care team when they perceive that a bad outcome is linked to something that went wrong in the OR. Great. I actually did some of that research 30 years ago with Jerry Hickson. So, um, uh, Aaron or Nathan? 
I'll just sort of weigh in on the sort of what is required under the law and, and what isn't, because I think there was some um, discussion in the chat about what is what does HIPAA actually require. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, is worth sort of starting out is that a video recording is not necessarily required to be returned um, to the provided to the patient. So the HIPAA privacy rule does require patients have access to what is called a designated record set. And then of course, then the definition goes into, well, what is an, in a designated record set? And it includes electronic medical records or medical records, uh, labs and other things and billing information that, the, that are involved in the, usually you would find that in the patient's record, um, but it also has this sort of, qualitative concern that it has to be used in some way um, to make decisions about the patient. So if it is being used solely for teaching purposes, or if it's being used in a way that it'll never be in, it'll never inform the, the care of that patient in any way, which, you know, I guess, you know, you could imagine that that's a possibility. It may not happen routinely. Um, then that would not necessarily, unless you had a you know, voluntary institutional policy of putting all of these recordings in the medical record, it wouldn't necessarily fall into the definition of a designated record set. And a patient doesn't have access to things that are outside of the designated record set. And again, that question of does it have to be, can it be an edited version? Um, could it be a summary or there could there be notes that accompany it? And the answer is that those things are all not, there's no clean answer from the privacy rule. The privacy rule does you know, say that yes, patients have to be given access to what's in their designated record set, but what exactly goes into that designated record set when it comes to the recording itself? Um, I think there is some gray area that institutions have to think carefully about you know, what, how they're gonna define that. Um, do they just routinely provide the entire electronic medical record or all uh, surgery recordings immediately placed in those? And are they edited? Are they, are they explained in a way that as Michelle said, would probably be helpful to provide some context. Um, and I think institutions have some, some leeway around that. Um, they're not just automatically required by the privacy rule to do, uh, to just put an unedited version of the recording immediately into the medical record. Thank you. Nathan? So it's funny, when I, when I first encountered this system and when I first met Theodore and the people at Toronto, uh, it was being used or piloted in several countries, but not the United States. And I was <laughs> like, uh, of course, it's not going to be used here because it's going to be a field day for plaintiff's attorneys and hospitals are going to be too risk averse. And um, you're going to have lawyers involved that caution against it and was surprised at the number of U.S. hospitals that have incorporated it. And I think that speaks to the, the leeway that hospitals have to structure the system in a way to protect it from being discovered in litigation or being admissible as evidence. Um, that's that's not to say it's clear. I think it's it's incredibly unclear whether these types of data, either the video or the subsequent analysis and recommendations and teaching materials are discoverable. Um, I, th I think it's incredibly unclear. The laws are broad. The laws uh, are written not in anticipation of technologies like this. The peer review privileges were contemplating, you know, m and committees and peer review systems required by Medicare, the Joint Commission or others. So, you know, we have, we have another example of the law being written, uh, anticipating kind of old systems. And now we have this new system that's generating all kinds of data. And it's, I think hospitals can, structure these systems to prevent it from being used in litigation. But a lot of that depends on how generous state law is and how, uh, how much flexibility hospitals have to funnel these through patient safety organizations or peer review systems. Uh, but we can get in, into the weeds in that, uh, on that a little bit more, but um, there are a lot there's a lot of legal uncertainty. There's not a lot of case law. When I went searching for cases uh, where courts actually evaluated whether video evidence can be introduced, I was shocked that, that there wasn't more. 
um, that there weren't more cases where patients tried to access video or introduced it. Um, so I want to ask another question about consent and again, throw out another hypothetical to, um, to sort of frame this a little bit. We heard a lot of discussion about how hard it's going to be to talk with patients about this and about how it's a problem that the interns are the ones who are doing it. And, um, and it occurred to me that maybe one thing that needs to happen in addition to everything else is that maybe the institutions that are doing this kind of video recording need to be out front about it and to say, you know, we are doing this. I mean, we do all kinds of things to say, you know, we collect data to use them for research, et cetera, et cetera. That's why you come to a teaching hospital. Why not think about the possibility of saying that the institutions that are doing this say, we are doing video recording um, or that we typically do video recording in part to improve your care and to improve teaching and to improve surgery going forward and being out front about that. And might that help the informed consent um, conversation? I'm just curious what you all, if you all, if that seems crazy or if that seems like something institutions might want to consider. Well, it certainly helps informed consent. I mean, it enriches informed consent. I think that's without question. And in states where there are potentially laws that might implicate um, surreptitious recording of an individual without you know, their express consent, one avoids any potential legal tangles there as well. Um, you know, the question I think is like, do, is there an ethical obligation to do that? And you know, the answer I think could be debated to that. We, we record lots of things about surgeries and we don't feel the need to tell the patient everything. You know, we, we've all been on airplanes where the pilot shares a little too much information about where he's going and how. And at some point, you know, patients probably don't care all that much about what's going on in the background. Um, there may also be patients who, who care a little too much about how they're going to appear on a video. And that's the last thing we want patients thinking about is they're being wheeled into the OR. Um, but I think the benefits of disclosure out, outweigh. Uh, it, it does avert any surprises or tangles down the line. If there's a bad outcome and there is a breach in, in the trusting relationship between the surgical team and the patient, it's not going to help matters in that very sensitive time for a patient to learn then that there's a recording out there that they weren't apprised of. Um, and again, it may help get rid of potential legal concerns and claims at an early stage if the patient knows this is there and can have their attorney and their attorney's expert review it. Um, you know, plaintiff's attorneys are not really in the business of bringing frivolous claims. They don't like to bring frivolous claims. They usually don't know they have a frivolous claim because again, this information is not available to them and their experts early on. So I think there are all kinds of advantages to arming patients with the information that this is out there, um, both for ethical reasons of informed consent and because it can have strategic advantages again, when you have a patient who is trying to make sense of an adverse outcome. And I agree, I agree with Michelle's um, assessment. And I also think that if is part of that discussion, that's part of the consent, the patient were assured that they're, that if this is going to be used in a teaching context, or if it's going to be reviewed later for quality improvement, that their own identity, um, they're identifying, you know, their features, you know, anything that might identify them will be uh, carefully protected. I think that would be very reassuring to a patient rather than just sort of worrying that, that, that their image and their vulnerability is going to be um, displayed even just am amongst the staff uh, in a way that they would find objectionable. So I think that, that that type of information, again, would be very useful, like not only how are we gonna use this, but how are you gonna be protected when we use it in these ways? Nathan? Yeah, and, and I, th I think the whole concept isn't really foreign to people. I mean, who among us hasn't called customer service and heard this call may be recorded for quality uh, purposes. <laughs> and not to be flippant about it, I mean, this is obviously different, but you know, I, I agree that it, it signals a commitment to quality. It's better to be transparent than not transparent. And it, it, you know, it can be reassuring to patients. So I have two questions in the chat that I wanna bring up. One is, 
um, whether the risk is actually greater with loss or destruction of a video, um, uh, particularly if something bad happened. Um, and then someone else asked how we ought to talk about um, recording of trauma resuscitations, which are done obviously without um, consent because there's no, you know, because there's no possibility of that. And should we be telling uh, the patients about that after the fact? So I'm interested to hear what both of you have to say about, uh, all of you have to say about both those things. So I think one interesting, um, one interesting facet is if, if surgical recordings, so I know the analog and the inspiration for this were flight recordings that Air Canada and other airlines did for quality improvement. And I know one way they got the pilots union on board was to routinely destroy the information after a set period of time. After it was available for use as quality improvement, there was a system that would get rid of the recordings as a matter of course. And so, you know, I think it's trickier in healthcare, particularly if there are adverse outcomes. If a patient is injured uh, during surgery, um, I'm not sure there's a clear answer. If you have a pre-existing system that routinely scrubs, or not scrubs, but deletes the data as a matter of course, that might be suspicious to a judge or a jury. So that's that's an outstanding question, um, and and I think Aaron and Michelle can speak to the other questions or this one. So well, I think oh, go yeah, ahead. I was, I was gonna say, I, I mean, I share your instincts, Nathan. I, I I think there are spoliation concerns involved if you're if you're scrubbing a recording, particularly where you have you're on notice that there was an adverse event and. You know, I certainly wouldn't advise anyone to do that, at least until the statute of limitations has run for that patient. But um, to, to the emergency uh, care contacts, you know, as the commenter points out, we don't, um, we're not able to get informed consent in the same way for a lot of things in the ED context. And um, one imagines there are some contexts in which consent could be obtained. You know, not everybody who comes into the emergency room is unable to give consent and unrepresented by a proxy. But there's certainly gonna be some that, that aren't, including the resuscitation context that is mentioned here. Um, you know, I do think if the institution has made a video and they intend to use that video, it's it would be prudent to inform the patient afterwards as part of the avalanche of information that's gonna be coming at that patient <laughs> as they are prepared for discharge. Um, I think that the problem there is that it's, it really it doesn't constitute meaningful consent in any way since it's already been done and because the patient is in a situation where uh, they're, they're not really able to process that kind of, be, because of the avalanche of information and their very vulnerable state, they're not really able to do with it anything meaningful at the time, but again, um, knowing that it's there may, may be helpful to them later as they're processing what has happened and trying to understand um, the, the health status that they're left with after that incident. And I think that to the extent that there is the, the record and retention, yeah, I, most institutions will have you know, a record keeping and retention policy that takes into account things like the statute of limitations in that state. And there's also, you know, federal record keeping requirements, which may be longer um, for reimbursement purposes under, you know, federal healthcare programs. And so I think that there's probably, if there is ever a document retention, you know, limit, it, it's probably pretty long. Um, and so I, I think it might, you know, go past its usual use in terms of what we would imagine would be sort of the immediate uses of this information. Um, but I would imagine that you would just treat it the same way you would any other um, health information. So let me ask you this, what if any limit should there be on where these data go after their, um, I mean, one of the questions that we were asked is who owns the film? Well, all of us are lawyers. And so we all know that you know, ownership and property is a bundle of sticks and it, ownership is a is a fluid in the law. So where should these data be able to go and what should be required, um, you know, and what should be required? Should there be limits on what downstream users should do with it? I'm really, I mean, this is obviously a ginormous issue in genomics. So I'll just share it with you all in the context of these video recordings. 
I'll just uh, weigh in on the on the sort of HIPAA limits. Um, there's one misnomer that 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 the privacy rule somehow follows the data because if it's health information that somehow HIPAA's protections attach to the data and, and follow it down, and that's not true, um, the privacy rule really applies to entities. And so if you're not a healthcare entity, a payer or a business associate of that, of that healthcare entity, then you really, you know, the patient, once the patient has access to the information, um, that's, the, 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 there's no HIPAA protection at that point. Um, the patient can do whatever they want with it. Um, and same thing with the, yes, there may be some, if there's a, um, a, an entity with whom the institution contracts to you know, edit the information, you know, process the information in some way, maybe redact a certain information, uh, that person, that entity would probably be a business associate and, be, and would be responsible to protect the information and not use it for purposes it hasn't been contractually agreed to um, use it for. So it's the, I think the, the loss of control of the information really mostly comes from the use by once the patient has access to it, then if they post it on Facebook or social media, <laughs> there's really nothing HIPAA has to say about that. And that's, that's really up to them. Um, but within the confines of within the institutional setting, um, it's not like that it, it can't be used for unlimited purposes. It sort of, you know, has to follow the what's agreed upon. It has to be minimally used for just the purposes necessary. You know, the patient's identity has to be redacted to the extent possible. All of those protections do apply within that setting. Um, but it's more the like once it escapes that institution is when, when HIPAA no longer applies. Thank you. I, I think that's a point that's really good to be clear about. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, so I think that's that's one hundred percent correct. But I, I would add that I, I think it may be time for institutions to start to start thinking about how to build in expectations into their own institutional policies about what patients should and shouldn't be able to access and do with recordings, whether it is audio recordings of clinic visits or video recordings of procedures. I think it happens enough, certainly the audio recording context that. Um, it would be advisable to take this from what it is right now, which is basically an issue that's controlled by individual physicians or by patients who don't ask before they record and move it to a place where we acknowledge this goes on, that it has a lot of benefits and that we have certain behavioral expectations for both providers and patients. And one of those expectations can be stated as uh, this doesn't get posted on the internet. This involves more than you. It involves privacy interests of others. Um, in the video who have not given their consent for that posting. And so uh, we, we expect to have our providers available to answer your questions about this video, but on your part, we expect you to respect their privacy and not post it online. Um, so I'm noticing that there are some questions in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Q&A, so I'll ask them. Um, and then I wanna come back to the issue of the expectations of the, of the team. Um, and so, uh, and the questions are, isn't the reality that surgeons record procedures all the time for various purposes and it's done without centralized control? And wouldn't it be a sensible risk mitigation to have a more uh, central and organized approach to routine recordings at all at an institutional level? And then, um, and then do we have a difference between patients having access to their chest X-ray, MRI, and colonoscopy uh, pictures versus intraoperative surgical footing? Um, and so I think with regard to the first question, the answer is clearly yes. <laughs> a policy is a good plan. Um, are we more concerned about surgical intraoperative? than we are from access to chest x-rays or MRIs or these photos. I mean, what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the trick. I mean, more information is not always better and I hate to be paternalistic about it, but it was, it was the, the first time I attended a surgical safety meeting, there were all these flight safety people from Air Canada and I quickly learned that you can know too much about flight safety. You know, it was not comforting to hear <laughs> about all these near misses and hear, um, you know, all of these, you know, potential um, incidents in, in midair that we never would know about as regular passengers. At the same time, something seems wrong to keep video 
from a patient of their own procedure. And I don't mean wrong legally. It, it just strikes me as a little, it's, it's something patients should have access to, but it's, there's, there's an analogy to the DNA and a genetic information, which is you can't just give patients raw data. You need someone to help contextualize it, explain it. And so just how we, just like how we have genetic counselors that help people understand the results of genetic testing, um, or at least we should, um, we, we also need someone to put this stuff in context for patients, just giving them the raw video, I think could be problematic, but you know, it's not, it's not an unmitigated good. It's not an unmitigated bad. It just needs to be handled correctly. I will have to say that since I spend all my time in the genomic space, the argument about access to raw genomic data is absolutely fierce. And, and if you say no, or if you have any concerns about it, you are immediately labeled as the most evil person on earth. So um, uh, Michelle is smiling, but I mean, honestly, um, as I suspect is Aaron, because it's just the truth. But, um, but, I, but I agree with you that certainly more is needed to interpret it. So I, I think you've got a good point. Michelle or Aaron? Uh, just to add to that, I mean, I think there's also, depending on the nature of the procedure and the clinical context, a, a, a danger of re-traumatization for some family members and even patients who view these videos without a support person present. Um, so, you know, we can all think about the worst case scenarios where it's a patient reviewing, you know, footage of a child in an emergent surgery that, that ended poorly. Um, I think that's another reason to have a, a superstructure around the sharing of these videos that is... As, as the commenter said, part of a thoughtful institution-wide approach, and as Nathan said, with support persons available. So I wanna come back to Aaron's question about the, the privacy interests of the team. And, uh, and I have a couple of questions about that. I mean, one is, you, you know, what are their privacy interests in this area? Um, you know, particularly because one of the big issues that is going on currently in parallel to some of these recordings is recognition that sometimes what goes on in the, in the operating room is not great um, um, in terms of um, things like sexual harassment, others of those issues. The other thing that I would ask you is, can it be made a condition of employment that you agree to have your, um, uh, to have your, uh, what goes on in the operating room uh, recorded. I mean, can that, can you be required to trade that away? So um, I did want to come back to that, Erin, and I'm going to start with you because you raised it, but I think this is a very lively question. I would imagine that for the operating room staff um, who are employed by the institution, yeah, I mean, it could be an institutional policy that this is what we do. We do it for a whole host of reasons. The benefits we find out way, you know, some of the, the negatives, including to the staff, right? I mean, if you are particularly um, less powerful uh, member of the staff, uh, being in a recorded situation might actually protect you from some of the more bad behaviors or from abusive practices by someone who might be more powerful um, than you in the employment context. So I would imagine that that could be instituted. I don't know what their expectations of privacy are in those recordings. Again, if you have sort of, if there are limits to how those that information can be used and who can access it, then I think that that sort of both reassures them, but also maybe they wonder like, well, if I, if there's, if I'm repeatedly being, you know, verbally abused in the, you know, as a staff person in the OR, can I use that in an employment context um, to bolster my complaint against someone? I think one thing that's complicated is uh, uh, sometimes the physicians, um, the surgeons may not be employees, but the staff are, right? If they are, um, in independent contractors, or just medical staff members, uh, of course, there could be medical staff bylaws and other things that sort of, um, alert the medical staff members that this is the policy of the institution um, and, and a condition of using the OR. But I think that you, know, you don't always have an employment relationship between everyone who is uh, working in an OR. And that I think that would complicate whatever policies the institution would develop. So anybody else about that issue? 
Yeah, I mean, I one interesting thing to me is that you know the, the more widespread recording systems become, I think the more of an argument there is that hospitals are obligated to do some kind of sentinel event um, scrubbing. So this doesn't really speak to what Aaron was talking about, but it's, it's kind of a separate issue of how much duty to do hospital do hospitals have under Medicare and the Joint Commission and state licensing obligations to do active surveillance for errors. And so, you know, I think, you know, with, with hospital data mining and the like uh, being more and more common, I think this might be one more stream of data that we expect from hospitals to use data for quality improvement purposes. And I wouldn't be surprised even for physicians who aren't employees, if it's a condition of their privileging <clears throat> and credentialing process at a hospital that they agree to these things. So part of the, the superstructure of building this into a, a quality assurance program. So since you're talking, I wanna ask change focus a little bit and ask you, um, what you think about the issues with machine learning and artificial intelligence in this space, because we heard, you know, early on uh, that there's no way to do this at scale without um, without those kinds of tools. But there is a tremendous amount of debate um, in, in this space about whether AI and machine learning actually um, whether there are problems with that um, that that may rear their ugly head as we move toward uh, developing these kind of analytics. Yeah, so uh, assuming, assuming the AI and machine learning program works and it's able to draw meaningful correlations and, and causal chains, you know, I think there are interesting cases of hospital corporate negligence where the facility itself is liable if it detects patterns of substandard practice and doesn't act on them. And sometimes this comes up in litigation where someone's privileges are revoked and the person whose privileges are revoked challenges that decision in court. And the hospital says, look, we ran a statistical analysis showing that your infection rates are twice of the national average or twice what the other surgeons averages are. And so uh, that statistical analysis has been subject to discovery and there are fights over whether um, it's covered in the, the peer review privilege or not. But, uh, you know, again, I think if hospitals conduct this kind of analysis with machine learning and AI and uncover uh, troublesome patterns, that there will be some duty to act on it. Um, and that, again, is, you know, hospitals already use claims data and all kinds of other data points from electronic medical records to identify patterns for quality improvement. And this is going to feed into that stream. And again, there aren't a ton of court cases that give us nice and neat answers to what data is usable and what data isn't. So this is kind of on the frontier, but again, as this becomes more and more commonly used among hospitals, uh, it might turn from a curiosity into a standard that we expect hospitals to use as data to take interventions. So I saw Michelle nodding. So um, do you have anything further to add? I, I think that's a really fascinating analysis, Nathan. And, and I guess the only thing I'd add is like, it, it, when you're talking about this kind of evidence that is, um, y, you know, calculated findings based on algorithmic um, uh, analysis, there, I think the evidentiary issues become more complicated. Is this admissible evidence or is it not admissible evidence? Because it no longer relates to the specific procedure under consideration in a malpractice suit. It goes to, you know, the physician's ordin like competence in general or uh, potentially habits, which is an evidentiary uh, uh, rule that is relevant to whether the, the evidence would be admissible. But it, it's, it's much more complicated and not clear to me that it should be admissible in a malpractice case. So uh, we have six minutes left and um, we've covered a lot of terrain, but I would love to know, are there issues that we've missed that we need to highlight 
um, that this group needs to be thinking about? What yeah. I would like to highlight, not because I have any answers, is this question of ownership, of like who owns the video and who can, you know, uh, control it. And again, I'll just throw that out there without necessarily knowing the answer to that question. So, and, and don't you think that that's going to matter to some extent, depending on what the purpose is? I mean, once it gets in the research space, all bets are off. It goes all kinds of places. Um, within the, um, you know, within the patient care clinic, I mean, QI space, maybe there's somewhat more, you know, I, I tend to think about where data go. And I think that that's going to, that's a much more defined network than once you get in the research space, in which case it just becomes all kinds of things. But thank you for asking that question. Um, anybody else? Michelle. I guess I just wrap up by saying, I, I think it's important that we bring our focus as far as malpractice liability goes to things that we can do to improve the accuracy of the medical malpractice system in giving compensation to people who are eligible for compensation under the rules that we have set up, which is to say people who have been injured by negligent care. And it's only natural that whenever any anything new, any, any innovation occurs in medicine that adds to the record uh, occurs, physicians get very nervous about the potential for expanded liability. Uh, but that <laughs> you know, just ethically, that can't be the perspective that we adopt when we consider whether this should be implemented or not. It has to be instead, will this help us sort through the hot mess of malpractice claims that get raised each year, most of which don't relate to negligent conduct, but again, get into the system for other reasons, including information seeking. Um, and, and again, I just wanna reiterate that on balance, I think there are really big net benefits here. You know, there are going to be cases in which these recordings indicate an event has occurred where money's owed, um, but we shouldn't hide from that. The, the goal right now among people who are working on making liability better is to try to fairly compensate patients who, who have deserve it, again, without going to trial, uh, just do it. Um, and that's a minority of patients, you know, it's, it's a quarter of all adverse events. And for the other 75%, again, we have to embrace anything that helps us resolve misunderstandings early on and get to the, get to the truth, um, even when the truth is hard for patients to hear, because it means there, there isn't money at the end of this journey. Uh, there, there wasn't an error. It, it's just a bad outcome. Um, but what there is potentially for them is a possibility of reconciliation with the team where injury has occurred, um, and understanding and ultimately acceptance. Um, and I would also, I, I think that's incredibly helpful, Michelle. And I would also say that, that I think there's powerful messaging that, that this community can do about this. And to say that we are doing this because we care about you and we care about surgical patients and we want to make surgery better. And that the whole point about this is learning and, and that, that I think being upfront about that and disclosing to patients that we're doing this in a meaningful way, whether it be through, you know, videos or, or, um, or realizing that what the intern says to the patient should not be what, and signing the form should not be what informed consent is about. That conversation should take care or take place earlier um, if it can. And, you know, and just say, this is a part of what we're doing. And that the goal is to make, is to make things better. I think, I mean, transparency seems to, it's a huge buzzword, but I think it's one that's really, really important in an area where there's so little trust. Nathan, I think you're gonna get the final word before Alex jumps in here. Sorry, I, I just had to riff off of that, Michelle. So. So, sorry for jumping the queue, Nathan. Oh, no worries at all. Um, I agree with everything that you said. I, I just think that the, the potential barriers to adopting these systems reside in both the legal system and in the medical culture. And I agree with Michelle that our legal system wastes a lot of time and energy and resources trying to reconstruct what happened during a procedure 
this can go a tremendous way towards resolving those questions. They're not unanswerable. Uh, you can have relatively objective evidence that shows what happened. I think the, the net benefits are so great uh, in reducing long-term errors that can be avoided that we need to figure out both the medical community and the legal community how to make this work for everyone. And that it's tricky, but I think it can be done. I would also, I would make one other point to uh, build on what both of you have said, which is that another reason people sue their doctors is if they think their doctor is a jerk and won't talk to them. And so if you have a pattern in practice of talking, that helps, I think. Um, so uh, in any event, uh, but you guys are wonderful. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Alex. You took the words out of my mouth, right? You, you, this has been a fantastic panel. Um, Ellen, thank you not only for moderating this fantastic panel, but for your mentorship for this meeting. I, I'm very grateful. And I think uh, your touch has shown throughout the whole meeting so far, the planning and everything. And thank you. Um, Nathan, you, you've been studying this for a while. It is, is such a great opportunity to see you again. And I appreciate that and, and all of your work and expertise. And Michelle and Aaron, you know, you are experts, of course, but, you know, came into this not being a topic that you focused on before. And the, the opportunity cost of blending your brains to this topic is huge. And so thank you so much for your time today. It's been great. And this is a uh, such an important panel. And I think all of the issues that are introduced are going to create for some exciting, exciting scholarship. So thank you all for your participation.